Hey, one rental at a time community. Uh, this video is for you. We've got the famous Jason Pritchard with us today. And as Mike would like to say, the uh, boys from Convoy. What's hey, up, how boys? You doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you guys for having me on. I uh, appreciate you uh, you guys taking the time to do this. Excited just to do this for uh, for Mike's community, man. Should be a good one. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, the just to give a little intro, we did um, have a, a list of questions that we wanted to ask you. Uh, in particular, with your personal investing strategy right now, obviously, the market's a little different. Um, so without further ado, we'll just jump right into it. Uh, the it. first question we had for you was, uh, what kind of deals, real estate deals, obviously, are you looking for currently uh, to invest in? That's a great question. And our outlook and the type of deal that we're looking for has definitely changed in 2023. And so I think this is a good uh, a good thing to dive into. So I'll rewind back a year and then that will give everybody that's listening a little bit of perspective. In 2022, 90% of the projects that we did, I think we did somewhere around 70 deals in 2022 were fix and flip. So the issue with fix and flip is the cash conversion cycle is typically the longest of the types of, of the projects that we're doing, right? Because we have to buy it. We have to deal with whatever's going on with the house, remodel it, resell it, that type of thing. And we got our hands kind of caught in the cookie jar at the end of 2022, beginning of 23 and realized, you know, with the shift in rates and all the different things that were going on in the market, um, we had to pivot um, early on in the year. And so now we're looking for things that we can get in and out of very, very quickly. Our main exit strategy this year has been buying at the deepest discount that we can and then literally sticking it right back on MLS. We may spend a few dollars to clean the property out, but we put it right back on the MLS. And one of the things that we have seen is that the investor buyer demand, at least in our market, which is central California, has not dissipated at all. There is still lots of demand for distressed inventory. And we have seen that there are people that are willing to pay uh, what I would consider premium prices on fixer upper houses. And um, the best way to get maximum exposure, is, in my opinion, is getting it you know, out in front of as many people and that's putting it on MLS. So deals that we can get in and out of uh, and turn very quickly is is what I'm looking for right now. Yeah, I think that's commonly called uh, definition wise, like there's wholesaling and then there's wholetailing, right? So you're kind of in the wholetailing market right now is what you're saying. Correct. Yeah. And I think there's a sweet spot, right? And because wholesaling has definitely gotten more difficult this year because the margins have obviously have compressed in, 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 in everybody's, in everybody's markets. And so now the assignment fees that I think people were typically seeing in our market were 20, 25, $30,000. And those have compressed down to five, 10, 15. Right. And so for us, that wholesale exit strategy is, is the perfect blend where we can buy it at a deep price. We're very fortunate because we're great at direct to seller marketing and we're also really good at raising money. And so we have access to capital and I have access to my cash where we can buy a deal, get it out on MLS. And we have found that the profile of the buyers that we typically like to sell to aren't your traditional fix and flippers, right? Because those buyers even if they can pay a little bit more than me, it's it's not that much of a premium. The best the best buyers for us have been, I would say, like the mom and pop contractors, the people that are looking to buy the property, fix it up, and then maybe move into it, or maybe buy it and fix it up and keep it as a rental. They don't need to have a twenty or thirty percent margin built into the the project when they're done. And usually, those buyers are easier to find once you go on MLS. And so. There's some inherent risk because once you buy it, you own it. There's no take backs, right? With wholesaling, your risk is pretty much mitigated. And, you know, if for whatever reason the deal doesn't work out, you don't really have anything at risk besides your earnest money. Um, but once you buy the property, you have to have the wherewithal to see it all the way through to the end. But 95% of the deals, what we're doing with now, we close on it, we'll clean it out, stick it on MLS, let it run for two weeks. And if we get an offer that's going to give us 80 to 90% of what I think we can make fixing and flipping it, we'll take it. And that has worked for us very well this year. So that's our main exit strategy right now has been is wholesale and, and also some wholesaling. Interesting. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing that. I, uh, I'll, I'll dive into the next question that we had for you. So obviously with the rate environment that we're in, I mean, what do you think about the importance of interest rates for you as an investor? And has it slowed down your investing strategy? I mean, you obviously switched kind of what the uh, target market or, or you know, property is, but 
has it slowed it down at all for you? It slowed down our appetite for acquiring rental properties. That's for sure. And so, you know, I bought my first rental late 2016 and from 2016 to 2019, we bought 50 units and we're just over a hundred now. And so we scaled up our rental portfolio uh, pretty quickly. And we, and we did that doing the burst strategy. That was the method that has worked very well for me. We've always been able to buy at a deep discount. You guys have done tons of refinances for us over the years. Um, it's been great working with you guys and the numbers just don't cash flow the same way when the rates have a seven or an eight in front of them, like when they had a five or a six or even a four in some of them. Right. And even on DSCR loans. And so, um, it's definitely slowed our appetite down there. And I think beyond just the the rising rates, the 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 market and the economy and just a lot of the uncertainty, it's it's made me want to be a little bit more cash heavy, I guess. And so instead of doing 70 deals and keeping 15 or 20 of them, I think this year we're probably going to keep three or four. And it's really more so for tax purposes than anything else, because we made a lot of money from flipping and wholesaling a lot of this stuff. So we needed we needed to keep a few things just to offset some of the uh, the tax liability that we're going to have. And so overall, we've had a very, very strong year this year, you know, even considering some of the the hits that we took and the losses that we took on some of our projects early on, uh, we pivoted very quickly and, um, you know, we've ended up doing good. So the only thing that the rates have really impacted me on is our ability to hold rentals. Um, and we're just going to kind of wait and see what happens. Um, and once rates cool down, maybe we'll start buying heavy again. Is there a, is there a, let's say you find a property, regardless of the rate being seven or eight or even nine, right? Is there a property that if you see the DSCR right now with current rents, because you're getting at such a low discount, is there a DSCR that you're kind of baselining at that you need it to be at for you to even I, consider uh, buying so the, the property type that is working well and the ones that we've kept in this market, even with high interest rates is small multifamily. So two houses on one lot, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, we're still able to buy those at in our market. And this is Fresno and Central California. We're still able to buy those at deep enough discounts. And we have seen some rent growth. I mean, rents have gone up pretty much everywhere. But here, the rental demand and the rent price increases. Um, I mean, it's pretty amazing. Like going back to what I was saying in 2016, 2017, I used to rent two bedroom, one bath houses for eight, $900. And now in a apartment complex, a two bedroom unit is getting $1,600, right? And not really a great area of town and more of a C or even a D neighborhood. It's pretty, it's pretty wild. So if I can buy two, three or four units still qualify for a DSCR loan and not have to get some type of commercial loan product, right? I can get it at a good discount. Um, the burst strategy will still work on those types of properties. And those are the ones that we've kept here. Um, it's two houses on one lot or small multifamily. So that's worked well. I think that's a great little thing and started to make it longer, but on the point of making it the smaller multifamily stuff, two, three, four units. Um, I've been telling clients that if you're looking to get into investing, that's probably the best way to get into it is the smaller doors don't jump into a five plex or a six plex on the get-go because the financing is different and those yep. things don't trade as often right the only reason you're able to get these things on a more of a discount and keep trading these things back and forth is because the volume is there versus like a five six seven unit even if the dollar amount is smaller it's harder to trade um and on an active market than these smaller multifamilies are is that something you'd probably agree with I would 100% agree. And, and and to add something to that, the value add component on some of those larger properties takes longer because even if you have six or seven or eight units with rent control in California, you can't just go in there and clear everything out and then just raise the rents and get all that done in 12 or 18 months. That takes time. We have a 12 unit building in Stockton that we're going on two years now. And it's just taking a long time to get the rents to a place where we need them to make everything pencil. We'll do that. And fortunately for us, we have the capital to be able to do the things that we need to do and we can be patient. But those smaller properties, also the value proposition and the value add component of those deals, it doesn't take as long as some of the other bigger ones. And so I think, especially if you're newer and you want to start looking at doors and your goal is really to hold stuff, that's the sweet spot for us. And I think it's probably true for a lot of different markets that are out there too, because DSCR will still work. It's not going to take as long to get it to where you need it to go. It's the right type of loan product for you. And there's still a lot of mom and pop sellers in that little space right there. So you can usually get 
um, you know, usually good prices depending on the situation and who you're talking to. Yeah. And, and thank you for that. And that kind of segues into our next question, which is, um, obviously you deal with a lot of new investors asking you questions all the time. Um, what kind of hurdles do you see common to newer investors um, that they struggle the most with in the current market? I think in the current market, a lot of it is up here. I think so many people are too focused on the narrative that's being pushed in the news and in social media and listening to people that are not getting the outcomes that they want in their business, kind of like, you know, I don't want to say older people, but people that are getting washed out of the business right now, the people that are getting weeded out that were able to find success at some point, at some stage in their career, but they haven't been able to adapt and evolve. And most people's default excuse is that, well, just the market's tough right now and rates are high and blah, 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 blah. I, we're having a great year, honestly. And we've had to work two or three times as hard as we did in prior years to make the same amount of money, but it is what it is. You know what I mean? Like it's not always going to be easy in this business, right? And so I think the biggest struggle right now is getting your head screwed on straight. And I talk with Mike a lot about that on his channel. I think most people um, don't fix the problems that are going on here and they wonder why the, the outcomes that they're getting in their business are not happening. And it's a lot of times it's just because their mindset is off. And so the way that you solve that one is by getting in close proximity with people that are thriving in your business, right? And if you're new, the way that you do that is you go to meetup events, you get on social media, you go do old school networking, which still works, right? Just meeting people one-on-one -on -one and, and developing relationships and then nurturing them, right? But making sure you're doing that with people that aren't planting these negative seeds in your head, right? You need to be around people that are thriving. You need to figure out how to add value to that person and their business. And then inherently what will happen is the things that they're doing will rub off on you. And then your job is just to take the blueprint that's working and apply it towards your business and put in the work. And if you've, if you're willing to work right now and right now you got to work really hard and I'm sure you guys know that better than anybody else. It's not, you know, people aren't calling you up with a million refis and all the things that we've been used to in the last couple of years. But I like times like this because for me, I know that we're going to be fine. And I know that on the other side of this market, there's going to be a lot of market share for the people that have built their businesses for the long haul to gobble up. And I'm, I'm excited for that. So I don't mind when things get tough because um, I it, it weeds out some of the fly-by-night people. So I think if you can hold on tight right now, if you're new, get around people that are doing the things that you want to do and implement those practices in your business, you'll be okay. Amen. Yeah, I love that. Um, on to our, I think, last and final question. So um, when, when let's say a student or a client of yours comes to you and they're asking about, you know, buying or flipping a property and what type of financing vehicles they should use, what, what do you normally, you know, tell or advise them to do? Is it hard money, private money, soft money, if you want to call it that? Um, you know, retail or like non-QM DSCR stuff? So I'll speak to my business model specifically. So for us, we, 99% of the projects that we've done, we've done probably 400 deals over the last eight or nine years. We buy directly from the seller and I use, initially it was my cash combined with hard money. So I had to scrape together the dollars that I had. I tapped into my life savings. We got a HELOC on our house. We did cash advances on credit cards. We just scrounged together enough to use the down payment and the rehab money. And then I'd use a hard money lender to buy, fix and sell the house, right? So we would do that over and over and over again until I stockpiled enough cash to start being able to keep things. So I've always liked the model of hard money, private money, or your own capital for the initial acquisition and the value add component, right? Because if we can buy it at the right price, we can fix it up. There should always be some margin that's left over. And when I started, my wife and I were doing conventional loans at first. And so we would do a, a loan in my wife's name, and then we do a loan in my name, and we would try to play that game for a little while. And then eventually that became too cumbersome and it just stopped working. And then we eventually started going over to non-QM stuff and the DSCR loans. And I, I've always liked the ease of the DSCR loans. You guys make it really easy. I mean, you're going to pay for some of that convenience in the form of the fees and the points and the, the rate that you're going to pay. But for me, it's totally worth it because once you start building a portfolio, 
and you have to do a full doc underwriting, it starts to become for me very painful, right? Like I just, yeah. it's one of those things that I'm not, I don't like to do that. So um, I think using that private or hard money to get your initial acquisition and then, and then eventually switch over to a uh, non QM, or if you can go conventional, if you want, but I think non QM is, is, is easier and better. And you're going to have to go there anyway, if you want to scale. So you might as yeah. well have it in your repertoire, especially if you're wanting to grow past eight or 10 units or whatever the loan limit is now. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's 10, but obviously for investment properties, but that's a great point. I want to kind of preface and make sure everyone understands though. It's when Jay's talking about this, it's not talking about you know, max leverage, 100% loan to value, you're still buying these deals at a massive discount if you're yep. buying them and also building in equity by putting a down payment. So what I've been telling clients is like, hey, if you're buying something on a 20% discount on the price from the market, and let's say you put another 20% down to purchase it, you're 40% technically equity in the deal immediately once you buy it. That's like a, a really good place to be to start. And then you can obviously, when you later on refinance, you can take out that extra 20% or 15%, however much, and you're able to kind of capitalize on the equity difference between what you bought it at versus what the ARV is going to be and really maximize your return. And I think that's what the goal of what you know we're talking about here, not necessarily telling clients like, hey, go 90%, 100% LTV and buy those things you know, with over leverage, which is kind of like how we got to the situation where we are right now, where a lot of these guys that bought on hard money are coming expired and now they have to sell it at a discount. They're losing money on all their deals. So just to make sure that uh, everyone in the, the listener base understands that we're advocating for good equity, not bad equity. That's that's exactly right. And, and the yeah. best way to mitigate your risk is to become great at finding good deals. And that's one of the things that I spent a lot of time working on at the beginning. And I think a lot of people, um, you know, they just breeze past that. If you can become the conduit where good deals have to pass by your desk before they go to anybody else, you can make however much money you want to make in this business, because that's such a big puzzle piece when it comes to investing. And so if you become great at finding good deals, then you can cherry pick the very best ones to keep and even come in under some of the leverage that even you're talking about, Mike, you know what I mean? And so that's really the thing. You sell the ones that don't really make sense keep the very best ones, you know, just lever them enough to get your initial capital back out. If you need to pull a little bit of cash out to reinvest, whatever, that's fine. I did that at the beginning. And then, you know, just can keep rinsing and repeating that process as much as possible. Yeah. I love that. Um, well, look, thanks again for your time, Jason. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to you, how should they do that? Uh, best place to contact me guys is on social media. Um, if you just put my first and last name, Jason Pritchard into either Instagram or Facebook, those are the two platforms that I am the most active on. Uh, feel free to reach out. We love working with the one rental at a time community. A lot of you guys that reach out and ask me questions. I love answering them and I love being a, a resource for you guys. So don't hesitate to, uh, to call me if you need anything. Thanks Jason. And how should people reach out if they want to speak with us, Joe? Go to conwayhomeloans.com and let us know you came from Morat and, uh, Thanks so much, guys. Have a good day. Love it. Thank you.